So we got Yair Pinto, finally. Get a chance to meet you. Well, it's great to be here. Thanks, for, thanks for coming to, yeah, for a visit. We're here at the TBN studios in Jerusalem with, and they, they, they have, I think, the best view in the entire city. This is pretty amazing, isn't it? Uh, Yair, tell me about how you got started doing this job. Well, I've been involved in, uh, in media, in news productions, in mm -hmm. various capacities. I was a producer, I was a little bit of a... This no. is all before the war. Everything before the war. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. For for multiple years, I had like a, a prayer show on a, on a Finnish uh, TV network called in, the in TV English? Seven in English. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. So even back then, you know, people I think uh, gave me a, a pass on my Israeli accent for, for some reason. Uh, girl sounds sexy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but then I I moved to to TBN, mm -hmm. basically, on April. And my official title is uh, Director of Operations. So it's more managing the, the facilities, the people, all the production, budgets, and everything that is going on okay. here in Israel. Okay. But then uh, the war started on October 7th, and it kind of changed life for, for everybody, and for me also, because I was called uh, to fight in the IDF the beginning, we were serving and stationed in the northern border with Hezbollah mm -hmm. for two months. Then my unit was called into Khan Yunis in the middle of the Gaza Strip. Wow. So... Um, what was that like? Well, that was crazy. I, I, don't, uh, I don't think anybody wants to, to go into the Gaza Strip and to see what's going on there because basically everywhere you step, there's an underground terror tunnel. There's... a uh, I don't know, a house that was converted into a sniper position mm -hmm. or an RPG uh, launching site from a window of a house. They stole their weapons in the United Nations buildings, in uh, kindergartens, in schools. That's and you saw all of this. I you saw this and my fellow units, the day we entered the Gaza Strip, mm -hmm. uh, we lost five guys. Wow. And we were attacked from a school in the Gaza Strip, and we could not launch an airstrike on that school before we entered in because of the rules of engagement, mm -hmm. because of the international uh, laws that the IDF is abiding by, right. but Hamas terrorists do not. So right. we cannot launch them, even though we knew that there were terrorists in that facility. We had to go physically in, and then a few uh, people lost their lives, and only then we could engage in launching the, the airstrikes oh. and and destroying that that's got to be so frustrating uh, just as a soldier that just makes my blood boil you know that they got to wait until somebody gets killed before they'll give you permission yeah, to do what exactly. you need to do it's and we we knew that they were so there painful. we knew that uh, they have underground tunnels underneath that school and they use that facility as a base of operations to launch attacks do you think after, with all your experience in there uh, i mean they've lost so many more people i mean what what happened on october 7th was unbelievable well, just incredibly brutal totally uncalled for, obviously, and, uh, you know, a, a real tragedy for Israel. But the upshot of all of that is that they've lost tens of thousands of people in Gaza and things, you know, all, so many buildings destroyed. Do you think they really thought that the response would be that strong? Well, first of all, I didn't think that they thought that the response would be this strong for once. I didn't think that they would they didn't believe that they would be so successful mm -hmm. on October 7th, mm -hmm. okay? So they, they, I think, underestimated themselves. They thought that they might, maybe, will get a few kibbutzim, a few Israelis killed, maybe a few hostages, not 1,400 Israelis murdered on the first day, yeah. and 250 kidnapped into the Gaza Strip. I think okay. that they didn't believe that the magnitude of that day uh, would reach these heights. So also the response of the IDF, uh, well, they didn't believe that it would be this severe and this strong and that it will last for so long, for wow. sure. But they were prepared. They were prepared for this for, I don't know, more than 10 years. They've been building their infrastructure, stocking up on weapons. They had, they still have lots of RPGs, AK-47s. Mm -hmm. The IDF found maybe 15 tons, and I've seen it. I went to the IDF special unit that deals with confiscated uh, arsenal and arms from the mm -hmm. terrorists uh, Hamas. Mm -hmm. There's tons and tons of AK-47s, of RPGs, of anti, 
uh, tank missiles, of anti-airplane missiles. What are they doing with all this stuff? Are they going to use it or are they going to destroy it? No, so for now, we are uh, keeping, we, the IDF is keeping it and learning what the enemy has in order to oh, okay. better, you know, p uh, prepare and defend our units against mm -hmm. these attacks. And then soon we're going to destroy it. I mean, what... What yeah, a lot doing? of it you wouldn't want to use, you know, probably. It's, yeah, it's, it's, pro it's not compatible with your own exactly. weapons. Exactly. It's mainly um, either Russian-made or uh, North Korea. Or homemade. Or homemade <laughs> yeah. in the Gaza Strip. I mean, they use basically pipes for mm. irrigation mm. and convert them into RPG launchers. Unbelievable. You know, so that's the, that's the situation. And it's terrible. And I didn't say that, but the reason I got into broadcasting the news was because the world forgot so fast what happened on October 7th. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm there fighting, and a few days later, everything flipped, and Israel became the, the bad guy the all bad of a sudden. Guy. Yeah, after we are defending our people ourselves, after right. we have, we still have hostages in the Gaza Strip, but everything uh, flipped, and I realized that there is no truthful information coming out of Israel. Mm -hmm. So that's why, at the beginning, we started just me and my producer. He was outside the, of the army. I was in the army with the phone, Okay, giving updates from the front lines, what is happening. And, you know, people uh, tuned in yeah. and wanted to pray, wanted to hear, mm -hmm. wanted to see what's going on. And then the operation grew and grew, and now we have, like, a, a full team. And I uh, hope you guys like the, the content of what we do. Well, I do. I, <laughs> I, I listen to Israel, it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I learn a lot from it. So let's talk about the objectives. Uh, it seems like that the government has set out two sort of contradictory objectives in that yeah. they they want to destroy Hamas, but they want to get the hostages back. And those two things like can't yeah. happen at the same time as we just saw with the six hostages that were killed. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, what a tragedy that, you know, these guys that we've been praying that they would get out for so long and they were that close. Yeah, were that close. Yeah. yeah, one kilometer away from where the IDF found mm -hmm. an Israeli hostage, mm -hmm. the, the Bedouin, yeah. Uh, and they released him only a few days before. It was, yeah, so close. But uh, I so mean, what do you think about these these two? How do you reconcile these two objectives? I think that this these two objectives are the dilemmas that Israel has been dealing with since its inception. Okay, mm -hmm. let me tell you, for me personally, in the IDF and fighting in this war. Okay, so the IDF is, I don't know if it's the most humane army or one of the most humane armies in the world because we care about the civilians, even of our enemies. Mm -hmm. So more than that, we care about the hostages, our people, more than anything else. Okay, so that is basically the first objective. But in order to fight a war and to win a war, I mean, you need to shoot bullets, you need to blow up stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to, to do these two things together. But the IDF was able to develop technologies and ways in order to make it happen and to be successful militarily. But it's very hard. Like I said at the beginning, that we lost IDF soldiers because we are humane and we didn't mm -hmm. want to blow up a school. You put yourselves at greater risk to keep from hurting civilians. Yes. And so, you do it all the time. So it's a lot harder when you're talking about Israeli hostages mm -hmm. that are there. And there is also internal pressure on the government yeah. to do everything to release them, even at the expense of risking the lives of the IDF soldiers right. or jeopardizing the objectives of this war. So it's it's always a tension, but this is a tension that Israel has been dealing with since its, its inception, because we don't want to go to the levels of the terrorist organizations mm -hmm. that put the lives of the civilians, you know, Behind, in front of them yeah. as, as human shields, right. basically. So this is what they do in the Gaza Strip, or Al Sinwar that is now hiding as uh, as uh, pretending to be a woman. Simarita. In, in, yeah, in, in the field is uh, not looking so good for him. Yeah, it's not. And uh, so let's talk about the resilience of the Israeli people. I ha saw this ridiculous interview yesterday where a commentator was saying, the, the economy in Israel is in shambles. People are fleeing the country by the millions. Nobody wants to live there. It's a terrible place to live. And I'm like, this guy obviously hasn't been yeah, to Israel. Yeah, he hasn't been to time. Israel. Yeah. If, yeah, he, if time to go to Tel Aviv to see all the restaurants open, even one day after we were attacked by uh, by Hezbollah uh -huh. rockets. Yeah, you know exactly. And even here, you just go down to Jaffa Street, and there's thousands of people yeah. out there. And, 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 um, so obviously, it has had a an economic impact on the country. For sure, yes. But what is uh, what are the what does that do to the national spirit and bringing you together? Well, I think that uh, <laughs> sadly, what brings us together, you know, the best in the best way is when our enemies want to destroy us. Mm -hmm. So that's what happened on October 7th. We, 
before the war started, we were kind of divided on political reasons. And the country was really split between right and left. We see it all over the world also, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. in this division. And it was no different here in Israel. But at the moment that we were under attack and we knew that we had to unite in order to survive, it united and reignited the spirit of what it means to be an Israeli right. or to be Jewish in this land and to fight for our lives and for our right to exist. I, when I came here on October 9th, I was on the plane from Tbilisi, Georgia here, and it was completely full yeah. of Russian Jews on their way back here to help. To come, they were people, yeah, yeah wanted, to, wanted to sign up and go no, fight. It was crazy. The first weeks of the war, we would get new people to join in our units that were already exempt a few months ago. They just made phone calls. Can I join? I'll do whatever I need. I'll come. I'll, I'll put some maps, you know, full maps, whatever you need me, I'll do it. And we had that. Old people, young people, people above the age of serving in the IDF just got on the plane, left their families, and came to, to volunteer and to help. So how can Americans pray for Israel, for the IDF, and, uh, you know, for this whole conflict? So, you know, I think that God called us to, to pray for, uh, for the peace of Jerusalem. And that's a very important Bible verse because Israel is basically representing the covenant that God made with the people of Israel. And it's an example for God's faithfulness to his covenant to each and every one of you, anybody. It's not like the people of Israel are special or better. The contrary. I mean, if God is faithful to his word to defend the people of Israel and to stay with us, then he will be faithful to each and every one of you with whatever you are struggling with. So, okay, so if you want to pray for the situation in Israel, okay, first of all, learn, pray to understand the situation and find some truthful information to base your prayers on because it's hard to pray for something that you don't understand, you don't mm -hmm. know. Okay, so I mean, go watch some uh, some videos uh, there you go. that some good people are, are people making. People that are on, they're on the ground. That's yeah, right. Yeah, from the ground, that's the best way. Okay? Yeah, and then make it personal. Find a hostage, an IDF soldier, or a city, and pray for that city, that hostage, that IDF soldier, on a daily basis, and then God will make this connection of how to pray even deeper for Israel, for the situation. That's and we fantastic. need your help because this is a spiritual war. This is not just a physical war because it doesn't make sense that the whole world and the whole enemies of this region will unite against Israel. We have no oil, no natural resources. Everything that mm -hmm. you see here is basically desert and hard work by the Israelis that live here. We just want to live here. We don't want war. We want peace. And that's why the enemy wants to destroy us. Well, we will pray that that takes a, let's do that right now. Lord God, I just come to you right now and I pray your blessing on this, the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. I pray for peace in Jerusalem. I pray for Yair and for his work that you would uh, just prosper the work of his hands uh, as he seeks to serve you. You give him wisdom and discernment and you'd give him a bigger platform. You'd expand his territory so that he can reach more people with the truth of what's happening here in Israel and help to change people's understanding to a true understanding of what's really happening on the ground. We pray these things in Jesus' name, Father. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank really you so appreciate much. it. All right.